welcome to the CPG Exchange Podcast, where we discuss current issues in revenue growth management, data and analytics, and category management. I'm the owner of the Data Science and Strategy Share Group and the Revenue Growth Management Share Group. Today, we're very excited to welcome Jack Carnady to the CPG Exchange Podcast. Jack is the Senior Director of RGM at Hostess Brands and the author of the book, Snap and Go. Today, we're going to talk about how Jack used his, his experiences in RGM working for bigger companies like Kimberly Clark and Colgate and how he used them to help stand up the RGM function at Hostess. And along the way, we're going to learn how the snap and go mentality of urgency, discipline, and playing through the whistle has contributed to success. Jack's going to introduce himself in a minute, but right now I'd like to introduce my co-host, Sara Batri. Thank you, Walter. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the CPG Exchange. This is Saurabh Atri at Tata Consultancy Services, TCS, where I head the go-to-market strategy for CPG and retail industry verticals. About TCS, we partner with over 500 CPG and retail brands worldwide, like Nestle, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, c &S Wholesale, and many others to accelerate their growth and digital transformation journeys. And now I will turn it over to Jack to introduce himself, Jack. Hi everybody, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, my name is Jack Harnady and um, I am the Senior Director of RGM and Customer Finance at Hostess Brands. And um, I also have had a lot of experience uh, throughout the CPG world for the last 20 years, working for companies like Newell Rubbermaid, Kimberly Clark, and Colgate Palmolive, primarily for the first 20 years in my in, in the sales roles and sales leadership, and um, also moved into uh, to RGM, the RGM space and sales strategy uh, when I was at Colgate, and uh, and certainly have have, have uh, been a part of the, the RGM space over the last several years and. Um, really seen how the transformation of RGM has come in a very short time. So excited to be here, excited to talk about RGM, also excited about talking about a little bit about Snap and Go and, and some of the mentality that, that I brought to the Snap and Go mentality to the RGM space. This is great, Jack, uh, and we're looking forward to it too. And we're gonna, we're gonna jump right in. So I think what's it, first thing that's interesting about your story and the journey, recent journey at, at Hostess is you joined there in July of 2022, right? So short, short time ago, but in that time you stood up the RGM function from pretty much ground zero. You have one of those people in the space that did it somewhere else and then has been asked to come make it happen someplace where it, it doesn't exist. And you've, you've achieved results way beyond what you set for your year one. You know, I think the way you characterize it to us is you, you've taken a five year plan and kind of condensed it into 15 months, which is interesting. Congratulations, by the way, but that's interesting for everyone. It will be interesting for our audience to hear about. So can you take us a little bit through some of these accomplishments and what it looks like from ground zero to now? Yeah, I think uh, credit give credit to where credit's due. I think, um, you know, Colgate Palmolive is a wonderful, wonderful company and have learned from some of the, some really great leaders that, that um, were there and are still there. Um, and I think we had the opportunity to really learn from a global landscape, right? So we were able to see how other countries, how other um, divisions around the globe were, were doing, was doing RGM. Um, it may, may be a little bit more advanced than what we were doing in the U.S. And so we were able to, to really learn and, and build from, from the ground up um, RGM just based on, on the global, you know, the global atmosphere, which was fantastic. So I have to give a, a lot of credit to, uh, to a great learning ground in, uh, at Colgate to be able to get a really good grounding of what RGM can be and what RGM uh, should be, you know, over, over time. So. Colgate was a great, great learning ground and great opportunity to build that, uh, build RGM from the ground up, even in the U.S., where we may not have been as as developed as some of the other countries. So, we took uh, RGM at Colgate from from you know one, once once a year for per category workshop over over three to five days, you know, building that from from a, from program to more of a mindset and uh, and more of a a process and 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 really driving that RGM uh, mentality throughout the organization, even, even throughout the US, which was, which was great. 
so fast forward to to hostess and uh, where I was asked to to build RGM from from the ground up and again I think it's a, it takes an army um, which we didn't have uh, but we had <laughs> but we had the right people on the bus and we had the right army so we had what we had was um, a very supportive senior leadership from the CEO on down um, every every person that was in that executive leadership team um, was focused on on a couple key key um, key areas and RGM was one um, one piece that they wanted to really really get behind as they were uh, as they were maturing as an organization so um, that I think that has such a, a huge important role in this where you have that that buy-in from your senior leaders you have that buy-in from from the, the the top to say we believe in this um here's what we believe but we want you to go drive what you think is the right way to go drive uh, an rgm mindset capability um with the right tools etc so um i think that was the key is you got to have that the top of the house um supportive and it's not just saying yes we support rgm it's it's having that executive leadership steering committee where you're meeting with that with that executive leadership um, on a frequent basis to make sure you're, you're showing the progress being made and you're hold, holding yourself and your team and, and you're holding everybody accountable to delivering what you say you can go deliver. So that was, uh, I think that was the, the part of the, the biggest step was just getting the senior leadership on board from day one. And then clearly it, it, it it helps with getting the right people on the bus from a team perspective. So we we're charged to, to build a, uh, a team very quickly. And um, as you want to move fast to find the right talent, you take your time to find the right talent. And um, we, we spent a lot of time working on, on finding uh, folks that we wanted to get uh, get into OSIS that could grow within within the RGM landscape and sphere. Uh, they had some experience that uh, that we're able to come in and, and um, really help us uh, you know, set our vision forward, which was great. So Mina and Jackson on our on my team, I did a wonderful job, um, you know, really socializing what what RGM was and is and what it can be for for the hostess brands. Thank you, Jack. Jack, you have described that some of the reasons behind fast early wins uh, that you got was due to getting the management support early on and getting the organization structure aligned in a way that draw commitment and consistency of execution. Can you describe to the audience on how did you go about getting that support? Uh, what was your journey like? And how the alignment with the organization help drive speed and faster outcomes for you? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing was, is we didn't look at it as, you know, the, I think the typical reporting structure, you know, I, you know, I, while I reported into the CFO and to finance, um, it really, we, we kind of broke that down really quickly and said, we're going to have a lot of dotted lines and they're going to all be very you know, strong dashes, they're not going to be um, even dots, right? So I think that was the key piece is that I had a line to, to marketing, I had a line to, uh, to our growth, off, growth officer, I had a line to our sales team, um, and I had a line to our CFO. And then, you know, as, as time evolved, I think that one of the key unlocks that we had was, was bringing our customer finance team and call it the old, the old way of saying the old trade team trade finance team into uh, into RGM and started to really get some some really good synergies there um, and it started to bring it all all together so instead of instead of just you know having that line to the to finance it was breaking down that the barriers and getting in in front of the brand team as often as possible getting in every meeting that you that you can being that uh, you know you know we'd like to call it that you know that quarterback of of the of the team and Really trying to drive, you know, the whole organizational, you know, awareness and mindset of when we're doing things, it's doing it through an RGM lens, and and you know, you're looking at multiple ways of doing, call it pricing action or or promotion, et cetera. So, um, I think that was the biggest part of it was just was not really worrying about who you reported to, is more about getting involved and getting a being a part and having a voice and having a seat at that table, um, no matter 
what part of the organization it was, no matter, you know, and, and really not worrying about, uh, not worrying about, you know, the reporting structure. It's more about just being there and having a voice. It was really important. And we're, that our, our organization was really supportive about that. So, I, you know, I think it helps when you are a, an organization that is relatively flat, um, not a whole lot of, uh, you know, we, we have a small, small organization, um, big business, small organization. And I think that really helped us um, uh, get that message across of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish as, as, a, as an RGM team, but, you know, really looking at it as a, what we're trying to accomplish as a holistic organization. And that's a, a great, a, a great way to transition to what we want to talk about next is, is you really need those sales finance people when you do this first part, right? Which a lot of RGM groups start out doing is you, you get in and get, you get rid of those worst trade promotion practices first. And that's not always easy, right? Because those worst promotional practices are in place because usually there's someone on the sales side and who's running an account team who really likes them and thinks they, they can't go away. So can you tell us how, you know, how you dug into that, those poor practices on trade promotion and, you know, sort of what you did leading the organization through to get, getting rid of them and what the results have been? Yeah, no question, Walter. I think the, the key piece of that was just the visibility and democratization of the data, right? So I think we were, we were um, working with a lot, there was a lot of data available. We just didn't have tools or resources to to publicize it. So there was there were you know there was opportunity just to get the message out via data and getting the data collected correctly and brought into one house that that would make it easy for people to see that that there were promotions that were were not performing well or or there were you know different parts of the business that were you know fines and fees. We didn't have visibility things like that. So just bringing all that visibility to one simple tool was a key unlock for us to be able to start saying, hey, did you know that your your brand strategy or your two for uh, promotional activity was was detrimental to the PL and here's here's what you know what the what the outcomes were that we were seeing, right? So I think that was crucial in the whole step was just getting everybody on the same page as having that. And you want to call it the one source of data and one source of truth. It really was the one truth, right? Is what here it is. We have it now. We can now we can socialize it, make it in, the, in a way that that people can can really truly understand what what a PNL is, all the way from from gross all the way down to you know to your profitability, which was a huge step in the right direction. So that was number one. I think just having that visibility, and then two was um, make you know I, I think super important is getting the voice of the shopper. Right, understanding what the shopper is looking for, you know, in this dynamic environment, you know, it's constantly changing. The, the shopper's mindset is changing. So, what worked ten years ago, what worked five years ago, what worked last year, what worked six months ago, not necessarily is going to work right now, um, and it's not necessarily going to be the thing that that she's looking for when, to interrupt her when she's walking through the store or looking at the circular or looking on her digital apps or what have you. So, we um, we really quickly pivoted to uh, to to test different offers and, 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 and engage that shopper on how she's engaging in our offers and what, what she's looking for. And so we start, we pivoted really quickly from, from what was working, uh, you know, the, call it the two for brand strategy to really a lot, a lot more consumer friendly and consumer um, engaging offers that, that started to really uh, start to really transform the business and results. So, we had, you know, I think for us, our, our opportunity was, was we wanted to test and we wanted to test quickly. We did that. We wanted to get those out in the market quickly. And a couple of customer teams that, that, uh, that did that started seeing results really quickly. And once they started seeing results, then it starts that, that snowball effect, mm-hmm. right? You, you start to, to get the other, other sales folks and the other teams engaged and you know, excited about what's going on at, 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 a, at a couple of the other customers. Uh, I want to, I want to do that too. So I think that was a big part of it was just, was starting relative, you know, quickly with, with testing, but relatively small with the, with the, the customers that we were, that we were executing with. And then all of a sudden the snowball effect and everybody was jumping on board to, to go, uh, to go try some different offers and different promotional elements. So um, I think that was a big part of it is just getting that socialization out there, getting the data out there, getting the socialization, the socialization, getting some results, some quick wins, and then being able to jump on board 
the rest of the sales team getting to jump on board and to go act, activate was just a, a bit of our process there. And it's certainly turned out to be pretty successful so far. That's when it starts to get fun, right? Where you're running, running, uh, start to run with uh, some wind behind your back now. And, and you have some people in the organization that almost feel like they, they're, they're going to be uh, left out on the performance line if they don't, they don't jump on that is, do you have any, any moments where you, you just kind of said, Oh, we got it now because people are coming to us. Yeah. I mean, look, 20 years in sales, I think I, I know pretty well at how competitive we can all be right now from a sales perspective. And and so I think that's a big part of this, that mentality is, is you want to, I'm not going to be left behind here. So I right. uh, better get on board. And, and I think the other piece of that too, is that when you start to get some wins, we start to socialize those with our senior leadership. And so senior leadership starts to notice. And so everybody wants to have that visibility too. Right. So this is natural. And that's, I mean, that's at any company, right. That's at any, and then, and not even just company or even CPG. That's just across. That's human nature, really, is to, to have that uh, that that kind of approach, especially if you're a competitive spirit. So, um, I think that was that that was a big part of it. Now, is it all all uh, rainbows and unicorns? No, I think there's 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 times where where we're like, ah, yeah, we would have done this different. But I think that's the best part of it is that that we've had some opportunities to do really well. And then we have some opportunities that are like, ah, oh, this is what we, what we do different. And so we're able to learn more and more and more. And then we just, we just uh, evolve from there. So we don't make the same mistakes twice. So uh, anyway, I think it's been a, it's been a fun journey for the, for that part of it. Um, and, and it's fun to bring this, this organization along for the ride. So it's been great. Jack, we're going to zoom out a little bit because I feel that you have had a very unique and interesting journey working in big companies like Kimberly Clark that has done RGM for some time and then Colgate who was developing it under your leadership. What learnings did you take to hostess that had not had previously uh, that function? But they hired you to to build it. Yeah, I think the, the the couple key learnings were how important clean data is, right? And how important it is to, to make sure that you do the due diligence of of making sure that all you know, that that the data ties and you're looking at data that actually that is telling you what it needs to tell you because. If you don't have clean data, you're getting some insights or you're building baselines or you're looking at elasticities that could be wrong and you could be it could be a it could be a fatal error, right? So I think that's the the big part of it is just you know as you as you go into this, putting the time, the effort into getting the data correct as as close as it can be and, and as accurate as can be is so important. Um, and I, and that, you know, that, that was a big learning at both KC as, as well as, as, as Col at, at Colgate is there's so much of it is consolidated in, it in a way that, that is all ticking and tying and, and, and everybody can understand it and ensuring the accuracy of it is super important from both a trade, a trade, you know, TPM pr perspective as, as well as, uh, you know, your consumption data and tying it all together and in, in the lakes, it's just making sure that it's all clean, as clean as possible. I think harmonization is super important. And that was one of the big key takeaways I had um, from both KC as well as, as uh, from, from Colgate. And it kind of led me down that path of what I told you earlier about the, uh, you know, data, um, you know, just the democratization of data and getting that out there in a way that people can actually visibly, visibly see it. Super important. So RGM is rooted in data and analytics. And if you don't have clean data and analytics and, and the, the, the right data and analytics, you're, you're going down, you could potentially go down wrong paths. And I think that's super important. That's like the very first step and fundamental of what we need to do from an RGM perspective. And I think I'd say from a Colgate piece, I also give a lot of credit again, like I said earlier, is just that the, the international view of it and being able to bring in, you know, that, that, that holistic view of, of what RGM could be. Um, and, you know, thinking about it from all the pricing, different pricing levers and thinking, oh, I, you know, maybe it didn't always think about uh, a pack size like, or I didn't always think about cross border challenges that could happen between the different countries. You know, we may not have that big of a challenge like that, but there may be that kind of challenge in different parts of the world. 
um, you know, th th as, then you bring in your e-commerce piece of it, which was a huge part of the business at, at, you know, at, at, a, at a Colgate or a KC. And how do you bring that to, to life at a, at a place where it might not be as big of a, of, of a, play, of a play like it, at Hostess? How do you start to mature that as you go along? So I think if you look back, at there, there's so many different learnings that you can have from, a, from, from, from the different organizations that you're, that you're a part of. And not just RGM, but just from a sales perspective, how do, how, do, how do the teams go to market? How do they do AOPs? How do they do you know, annual planning, et cetera? It's just, it's a, um, it's a great way to, to be able to, to learn and, and, then, um, and then bring it to an organization at, at a smaller size, um, at, at a maturing company like, like Hostess and, and uh, keep moving. Data cleaning and harmonization, Jack, is one problem which exists, whether you are a $2 billion brand, $5 billion brand, or even a $20 billion brand. Uh, how can the RGM executives or executives who are you know starting on the journey, because uh, the scale of data cleaning uh, can be very overwhelming for um, the executives. Are there any best practices, Jack, or any uh, tools or any uh, frameworks uh, that have helped you, uh, you know, carry on across the different brands that you have worked in. Yeah, I think it, it's again having that that focus, and we don't have a, a, a huge team, and we've had a lot of help doing that. So I'd say, um, if you don't have the the resources to do it, I think in terms of people resources to do it, um, there are a lot of ways to to you know to get help. Um, within the or within within the marketplace, so um, that is, I think you know, a lot of a lot of you know, the, the TPM and RGM and, and other providers that are out there um, have really robust ways of helping um, that, as well as some other other consultants that are out there too that have some good ways of, of harmonizing and helping that process. So. Um, I, I think, you know, as you look at it, depending on, on the size of business you are, you don't have to take it all in house and don't have to have that, that you don't have to be proud that you created the architecture of, of, of the data, right? It's just getting it right. So if you can get help along with it and then eventually mature it along the way and, and where you can take it on, that's awesome. But I think it's important that you, you got to start somewhere and you got to admit that, that we don't have a good architecture and you got to figure that out and, and make it cleaner and, and make it, you know, make it better. So um, I think that's one thing I do appreciate of Hostess is that, hey, if we have an opportunity that you see, let's make sure we get the right resources. I'll be, it may not be a huge IT uh, data scientist team, or it might be, you know, some folks that, uh, that are out there in the marketplace that have that ability to do that to help us. Thank you for that, Jack. All right, we're going to switch now and talk a little bit of Snap and Go. Um, yeah. You published a book last year, and it's just a uh, congratulations on it, by the way. It's just beautifully written, and it kind of weaves your growing up experiences and your family and through uh, through parochial school in, in Chicago and then on to Northwestern University as the, as the long snapper. But within that, you're really weaving those lessons that have come through with you and that you now use as a uh, you know, as a husband, as a, as a father and, and as a business person. Um, but I know that it's in everything that you do. So, you know, tell us a little bit about Snap and Go and, and how you sort of use those, those lessons that you learned along the way and in, in what you do at Hostess. Well, thank you for that, Walter. It, it is, uh, it's been a, a great journey. We published this book, uh, I call it about a year ago. And, um, I think it's just been a, uh, a whirlwind since then. It's been a fantastic way of, of having some great dialogue around um, around some of the life lessons I've had over the years, and and also a great way to to say thank you to uh, the people that I learned from. And I think that's the biggest part of it. Uh, that you know, if I look at at you know my life, is there's been so many people that have helped form who I am today. So that was a big part of what, you know, really a desire to, to say thank you to, to a lot of people that, that had an impact on my life. And um, it's, it, it's a fun way of, of, of uh, structuring the book too. So it is, it's 10 chapters. Each chapter represents one second of a punt play. Um, and really at the end of the day, it kind of gets a little bit deeper and, and it gets into uh, to, to really, you know, 
how do you how do you you're breaking it up into a couple of different sections right how do you prepare then you get into the snapping part of a long snap and a punt play and then you go and have fun so um what's interesting is that i wrote the book with uh with six chapters all about preparation right? <laughs> so six chapters all all around this thing called prep which if you look if you look at anything you do you know 90 percent of this of what you do is all about prep for that one moment and uh and so six of the ten chapters and it probably should have been nine of the ten but it's really six of the ten were, were all about preparation it's like play like you practice use your senses prepare with faithfulness line up accordingly scan the defense you know double check your surroundings like all those things is that's all before the play even happens so you're you're working and working and working and preparing and preparing and per preparing before you actually uh, do the activity of, of snapping for a punt play so um, to me, that is so important is is all about the preparation that you do. And I kind of go back to looking at it, it's like to think about this is that I, I played five years of college football, really played four years on the field. Um, I, I played a total of 35 minutes, 35 minutes total playing time actually on the field and over over that five year period and over five years I practiced or prepared for 350,000 minutes. <laughs> so if you think about the, the, the time, magnitude. <laughs> right, I like you think about it, it's like, wow, that, that minimal amount of time that you're actually on display, you're preparing so much. And really at the end of the day, I started log snapping when I was five years old. So think about the amount of time that, that you, that you were, I've been doing, that I was doing this, right? But at the end of the day, it's all about preparation. And then once you prepare everything that you're doing, when you actually go do that activity, when you actually do the snap, you're fully, you know, it's like you trust, you're so, you trust yourself and what you're doing. You have that trust that, that it's, you're, you're snapping blind. You have, you know, you, you're already, you're doing it. You've already seen yourself do it and it's second nature. It's a habit. Um, and then you go, right. And then you go and you, you fully commit to, to running down and trying to, you know, make a tackle, um, you leave it all on the field, give it all you got, you do everything you can, and then uh, you, you're executing. Not only that you're executing the opportunity, but then you're executing after the after the play. So you go back and review over and over and over again, every step, every motion that you had, so that you give yourself a, you know, a grade on how you did, and then you learn from what you did right, what you did wrong. That's fantastic. Thank you for that, that Jack. And I want to I want to pull out one person that you know you talk about a lot of the, the people in your life, but I think your grandmother Betty, you write about her, and you, you talk about this pretty rare that we've talked about skill set. That's uh, that's also in, in in my wife Jennifer. You try to emulate, and it's not the easiest easiest thing to do if it's not in you. And you describe your 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 grandmother, Betty, is that person that no matter who is in front of her, who she's talking to, who she's focusing on, that person in that moment is the most important person in the world. And, um, you know, having been the leader of some large groups and, and organizations myself, I can tell you that's not so easy when you've got people standing at your office door, three deadlines you got to get to, and, you know, in a meeting at the top of the hour, so how do you, uh, you can talk a little bit about your your grandmother and that mentality and how you try to do that, uh, how you try to emulate that and what you do? Yeah, I was fortunate. Um, she, my grandmother worked at the same high school that I went to uh, for 37 years as the uh, the administrative assistant, and she basically ran the school. Um, but she was five foot nothing, and and you could hear her walking through the halls uh, of, of of our all boys. Uh, Catholic High School on the south side, south side of Chicago in a really difficult neighborhood. Uh, you could hear her walking through and she didn't care who you were, what you were, if you were Donovan McNabb or or uh, any or, or, or Jack Hartney, she didn't care who you were. She was going to make you known, make it known that she was going, she was running the show and that she was she was in charge. However, when you were talking and engaged with her, her, your, her eyes were locked on you and you better have your eyes locked on her. I was also fortunate to have uh, four years of, of drive time with her from to and from school, about 45 minute drive time. She picked me up every morning at 7.20 and best believe if you weren't out on the corner at 7.20, she'd drive right by um, <laughs> and she wouldn't stop. Uh, but when we were in the car, uh, not, that was it. You were, it, you know, she probably should have been a little bit more focused on the road because uh, she was, she had quite the heavy foot and was, uh, was, was uh, an aggressive driver, but uh, she was focused on you. She was focused on uh, what you had to say and your 
conversations that you had with her during that 45 minute period were just deep and, and intense. And, um, and you could just tell that she was giving you everything that you had and you were going to give it back to her. And so I learned that from an early, early age, you know, that, that, that you're engaged with who you are engaged with. The most important person that is that you're engaged with at that moment is the person that's in front of you. And as a leader, uh, you know, with large teams and and as a, a leader throughout you know my career that's been my mentality is that lock out the distractions put the blinders on if you're sitting in front of me if you're if you're engaging with me that's going to be the most important thing that i'm doing knock out the, all the dings and the beeps that happen with emails that's not important it's what it's the person that's in front of you and and i think um, that that's how I I've, let, I've tried to lead and try to live my life is that when we're engaged we're going to be we're going to be super engaged with each other um, and deeply uh, learning from each other on, on how we can do better so uh, that that's been a really important lesson and one of the most important lessons of my life and and uh, had, a, had a great person to learn that from uh, uh, in my grandmother thank you for that Jack thank you Jack uh, and just one curiosity, Jack, did having grandma as a head, head uh, of the school helped you? Is that the reason why we see you? You have topped in all the classes and now you've gone to the Northwestern because having a grandma who is the head of the school helped? Uh. Well, I tell you what, it was intimidating. I did not want to, uh, to, to be, you know, she was the first to know anything, right? So, uh, so it was really important that uh, I had my head on straight at all times and and uh, made sure that uh that my grades were coming in because i knew that the teachers were all super good friends with her and i guess who'd be the first person to know what my grades were it wasn't my mom and dad it was her so um you know she would know when I, there'd be challenges and she would try to help me through them um, but yeah i think it certainly helped me with the discipline um to get you know, I, with through other things also, obviously with with football and, and some of the discipline that comes with that. But uh, but having her um, there certainly certainly kept me uh, very focused on doing the right thing at at all times. I'm sure. Thank you, Jack. This was a very interesting story. Thanks for sharing with uh, the audience and uh, us here. Jack, going back to the snap and go mentality. Uh, now, you had mentioned that at the end, it is about preparation. Now, whether you are an executive or whether you are a parent uh, trying to bring up, uh, you know, your kids, preparation is something that, you know, everybody does. But what is it that you would uh, specifically like our audience to know that can help them improve both in personal and their professional lives. Yeah, I think you know preparation is key, right? And I think you play like you practice. I said that earlier, and I think that's really an important one. Is is, and it's fun because being able to now coach my my nine year old son and six year old daughter, you know, some of these different mentalities of of you know, hey, just don't go through the motions. Why are you doing it if you're going through the motions, especially at a place like like practice, right? So basketball practice, even yesterday with my with my son is is you will show up on Saturday morning at the game the way that you prepared yourself during the week during practice time, uh, uh, you know. And I think that's really an important aspect of it is as you go, don't go through the motions through your day through your work day. You're there for a reason. You're preparing your company, you're preparing yourself, you're preparing your family for something that's bigger and greater. Like in, in, embrace that. And I think that's that's something that that don't go through the motions is, is one of the biggest pieces of it. Um, is because as you go through the motions, that's how you're gonna show up when the when the game really counts. And I think that's one big piece that that I learned uh, that that playing like you practice is is a is a really good way to think about. I'm going to show up today because on Friday, if I have a big meeting, I'm going to show up the way that I showed up on Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I think the other one for me too, Jack, is on the other end is that playing through the whistle. And I know, yeah. I think that's a big part of business and specifically RGM where you don't, oh, even for the success you've even had in the first 15 months, you don't always get there the first time. The sales team doesn't always embrace the new initiatives and there just has to be that, never ever giving up 
on the play part uh, as well, right? That I think is important. That's a great point. And, and you never know when that final whistle is going to blow. So I think it's, it's also important that you keep pushing it. And, and the other piece of it too, and, and I think it's a huge part of it is never being complacent, right? So what, if you're here today, it's what you continue to do, right? So I think if there's any message that anybody takes away from it is that just because you got here doesn't mean you're going to get there. So you got to keep pushing it um, and, and keep really, really working. Don't, don't get complacent on, on, on positive results because positive results are probably the, the worst thing that can happen because, <laughs> hey, celebrate. Would you want to celebrate your successes and have fun with it? But you also got to, you have to understand that, that, you know, somebody's coming after you or your competition's coming after you right, right behind you. So you got, you cannot get complacent uh, with, throughout, throughout that process. Okay. Well, Jack, I want to thank you uh, for being with us today. I want to thank you for making the, uh, the CPG exchange podcast, the most important podcast in the room this morning, as we've done the record. Uh, the book is called snap and go. You can find it on, on Amazon by uh, Jack Harnity. And we want to thank you for being here. Um, and we hope uh, the audience enjoyed today's podcast and uh, we look forward to uh, future episodes of the CPG Exchange podcast. Thanks, Sarb. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.